Doc! What's up? <laughs> I, didn't, it's fine. Took a you. I mean, you know, it's uh, to those who wait, right? Exactly. But I, I have so many of my friends who now follow you and I see them all liking your stuff. And I'm like, you know, I am literally giving my friends and followers health by giving them you. Absolutely. I yeah. I mean, it. I don't want to think of myself as the, the second coming of Christ, but it's something like that. <laughs> Pretty close. Mm -hmm. Mate, um, uh, let me do a little intro and like, let's get these people uh, knowing who you are before we get going. We have so much to talk about. If you are interested in the best diet to consume, what supplements to take, is meat bad for you, is salt bad for you, how to fast, how to build lean muscle, staying hydrated, athletically performing at your best, today's show is for you. Because today I get to talk to Dr. James Nicolantonio, a cardiovascular research scientist and doctor of pharmacy. This guy has even testified in front of the Canadian Senate regarding the harms of added sugars. So don't invite this guy over for a piece of cake. Dr. Nicolantonio serves as the, as the associate editor of Nutrition and British Medical Journals Open Heart, a journal published in partnership with the British Cardiovascular Society. He is the author or co-author of approximately 200 publications in the medical literature. He's written a bunch of books, including The Salt Fix, The Immunity Fix, and most recently, Win, touted by Ben Greenfield as one of the most evidence-based books on athletic performance. In other words, this is a man worth listening to, and that's why it's such an honor to be speaking with him today. Doc, welcome. Thanks for having me. I, I, a couple of years ago, my wife gave me, for my birthday, The Salt Fix, and that's when I knew I was a real nerd. Um, tell me, <laughs> tell me what happens to the body when we eat a low salt diet? So essentially, I guess we should start with sort of what the guidelines consider a low salt intake, which is essentially less than one teaspoon of salt per day is considered a low salt intake. And if you look at, um, the prospective studies, um, including, uh, the meta-analyses that actually look at the urinary excretion of salt in the average human. So basically people, that's a good reflection of intake when you look at urinary um, excretion. And people who consume over a low, a low salt diet, so typically between one and a half to two teaspoons a day, instead of less than a teaspoon, they live longer. They have less heart attacks, less strokes. Um, so it doesn't match. The guidelines don't match exactly what the actual clinical evidence does. And so when you go below that three gram or one and a half teaspoons, all the stress hormones increase, all the salt retaining hormones like aldosterone, renin, angiotensin two, these things that we block with medications to reduce heart attacks and strokes all go up between two to five fold to retain salt. And so heart rate goes up, cholesterol goes up, triglycerides, insulin, and so for some reason, we think that maybe a small reduction in blood pressure is going to somehow offset all of these harms, which just doesn't make any sense. Right. Well, I mean, whenever I post anything about eating lots of salt, uh, it's usually a post from you. I get a couple of people going, what about people with high blood pressure? Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's the common misconception, too, is that, you know, A equals B equals C, meaning if you consume a high amount of salt, it's going to automatically lead to high blood pressure and it's going to automatically lead to cardiovascular events. But, but nothing further could be from the truth. We need salt. We need a blood pressure to live, I mean, to perfuse our organs, um, to deliver oxygen throughout our body. So we need a blood pressure. And when you don't get enough salt, that can lead to too low of a blood pressure because it depletes your blood volume. So even if you have a reduction in blood pressure with salt restriction, and I lay out a lot of evidence this in the book, it's you're just dehydrating the person. It's not even a good reduction in blood pressure. So I could I could lower your blood pressure by saying only consume one cup of water per day. I'm just going to volume deplete you. It's essentially what you're doing when you're cutting out your salt intake. Uh, let's go to hydration now because it seems incredibly important to stay well hydrated. How do we use salt to stay hydrated? What's the best way? Well, usually, I mean, how I typically think of this is animals – they don't track, they don't have any type of tracker. They use their brains. When they have a craving, they go out, find salt via salt lick, and they consume till satiation. And, and we have the same uh, salt thermostat in the brain. Um, just like basically our hunger is controlled by our bodies and how much we need to eat, salt is very similar. How much we need to consume is controlled by our salt thermostat. So essentially salt to taste, if you're craving salt, that's typically a good sign that you're not getting enough. 
And when it comes to hydration, most people get it completely wrong. A lot of people think just consuming plain water is what you should do. And actually that, what happens when you consume plain water, whether this be just throughout the day or prior to athletic performance, is you're gonna drop your sodium levels, okay? And that's gonna cause the body to actually wanna get rid of fluid. You can actually drop your blood volume just by consuming plain water. And that's the last thing you wanna do before athletic performance because what ends up happening is within five minutes of vigorous exercise, because you're pushing so much blood to working muscle and to skin to dissipate heat, you get a drop in blood flow to the heart um, and you get a drop in blood volume of about eight to 10%. So you wanna get ahead of the problem prior to athletic performance. You wanna actually prehydrate with salt and fluids and boost your blood volume by about eight to 10% to offset the drop. And people get this wrong. They try to hydrate during vigorous exercise, but you, you've missed the boat because when you are vigorously exercising, um, your ability to absorb fluids dramatically goes down. So gastric emptying, basically, essentially, the fluid flowing from the stomach to the intestine is inhibited when you're vigorously performing. So you really can't get fluids into the body very well. So you want to prehydrate about an hour and a half before performance. Yeah, right. So that's that's really good to know because a lot of people are drinking water vigorously while they're exercising. What they should be doing is what you're saying is about 90 minutes before pre-exercise, drinking bit of salt and some water. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're looking for acute boosts in performance, your top level benefits are going to come from consuming between 3000 and 4,300 milligrams of sodium in about a liter of fluid. And you slowly consume that over about 30 minutes, starting 90 minutes prior to exercise. Now, if you're just looking for um, not a huge boost in performance, but you don't want to like pass out during like performance, then just 2000 milligrams of sodium and about 20 ounces of fluid is perfect. And what does 2000 milligrams of sodium look like? Uh, is that a, like a teaspoon? What does that look like? Yeah, it's just under a teaspoon. So one teaspoon of salt is 2300 milligrams of sodium. So it's usually good to have about a teaspoon of salt in about 20, 24 ounces of fluid. 90 minutes before performance. Perfect. Now, what does a hydrated body, how does it athletically perform better? Like, what do we know about when you're, when you're really beautifully hydrated, you've had your salt and water 90 minutes prior to exercise, how do you perform better? Yeah. So two, two things we can discuss, sort of like what exactly are the benefits and how are you performing better? Sort of like two different questions. So to give you an example, there's been several studies um, of vigorous cyclists in the heat. And if they preload it, well, let, let's start off with, they didn't preload with salt and fluids. They were able to vigorously cycle for 40 minutes, okay? When they actually prehydrated with salt and fluids, they were able to cycle for 61 minutes. So it increased their ability to vigorously cycle for 21 minutes, wow. which was a 52% increase in how long they were actually able to exercise, which that is about 20 times better than any pre-supplement you will ever get on the market. So beta alanine only increased exercise duration by about one minute. So we're talking, so we're talking about 20 times better than your best pre-workout. And the heart rate was also down by about nine to 10 beats per minute. And the actual core body temperature was three quarters of a degree Fahrenheit less. So those are some of the benefits that you can see. And there's also, it's not just that you can exercise longer, your power output is actually increased. So there was one study that looked at cyclists as well, and they gave them a 15 minute time trial, like how, basically how um, long or how many kilometers can you cycle in 15 minutes? And the people that preloaded with salt and fluids were able to cycle a full kilometer longer in that same period of time. That's how much power output was increased, which is about eight to 10% increase in power output. So, wow, these are not small amounts endurance and, and power. Yeah. And then uh, how this works is, again, the main thing is that it's boosting blood volume. And because you have blood flowing from when you start vigorously exercising, going away from the heart towards working muscle and towards the skin to dissipate heat, you actually have a relative drop in blood flow to the heart. So that increases what's called oxygen demand. It's called myocardial oxygen demand. And if you can boost blood volume prior to performance, then you can decrease myocardial oxygen demand. The heart rate will be lower. Blood circulation will be much better. 
basically you can remove waste better, um, cardiac output is better. So it's just um, basically the linchpin, the main thing that causes people to suffer when they're vigorously exercising their performance is that drop in blood volume. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, when you, when you taste sweat on your own skin, you taste that it's salty. And so it doesn't really make sense to be hydrating with just water. Uh, can you talk a bit about like what sweat is, what it does? It's, it's, it's an attempt for our bodies to cool itself. Is that correct? It is. I mean, if you actually think about it, we are, we are the number one mammal that loses the most salt in order to basically thermoregulate. Okay. The only other mammal that comes even close and it's only about, they, it only loses about half the amount of salt that we do is horses, but essentially what we did is we lost fur and we gained the ability to essentially be really good at dumping heat so we could persistent hunt for hours. Whereas other mammals were will overheat because they can't basically sweat and cool themselves off. So that's how basically humans fit like physiologically how we work. So we lose on average 1200 milligrams of sodium or half a teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise. And that will go up as ambient temperature goes up. So if you're exercising at normal room temperature, you lose half a teaspoon of salt. As you hit 80 degrees Fahrenheit, you lose about three quarters of a teaspoon. And then when you hit like 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you lose a full teaspoon of salt for every liter of fluid loss. So that, that my next question is, what if you don't have any salt that you've ingested and you're exercising to that level at that temperature? What happens? Yeah, I mean, so essentially, if you're exercising in the heat and you're losing a full teaspoon of salt, you can literally die within a few hours if you don't replace the salt and fluids. And 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 is, is that salt zapped from somewhere else? Is the body like trying to get salt no matter what it can do? Does it or is it like? Yes. Yeah. What does it do? So, yeah. Well, what's interesting is actually we've learned from balance studies that the body will try to maintain a normal blood sodium by actually pulling sodium from bone. So osteoclasts will become activated, these things that actually degrade bone, and they'll pull sodium um, with them to try to maintain a normal blood level. But what ends up happening is the body also pulls magnesium and calcium and it spikes blood, calcium, and magnesium levels. And so the body thinks it's overloaded in magnesium and calcium and it'll start flushing magnesium and calcium out of the system and you won't absorb it well from the diet. So when you're on a low sodium diet, balance studies show you actually become um, in negative balance of magnesium and calcium because of this. So what does that mean for bones that have had their magnesium, sodium, calcium zapped from it? What does, what does that look like? Yeah, low sodium intakes are associated with less bone mineral density, increase in fractures, and then increases in falls as well because of the decreases in blood pressure and the dizziness, what's called syncope and fainting. So you basically have, um, especially an elderly population is very susceptible to this, where if they go from a seated to a standing position and they're on a low salt diet, typically their blood pressure bottoms out, their heart rate skyrockets and they can pass out and fall. And so sodium is definitely very important. Just one of the other minerals that helps to make our bones strong and dense. Which is so interesting because a lot of people, you know, high blood pressure is probably associated more with people of age, you know, who are a little bit older. So, you know, let's just say you wanted to take care of your parents or grandparents, depending on their age. And you know that getting enough sodium for an older person is important. Like you just mentioned, especially like for the bones, how do we make sure that our parents and grandparents are getting enough salt without affecting their blood pressure? Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally know what you mean. So really it just comes down to diet. So you have half the population, probably more that are consuming a highly processed food diet. So they're, they're getting adequate amounts of sodium, but they're getting too much refined carbs and sugar. Right. And that's spiking their insulin and causing them to retain too much salt. Right. So the, the key is to switch them over to a whole food diet. But the problem with that is we no longer consume the salty blood and interstitial fluid that used to come with the whole animal. So it's a very low sodium diet if you start eating whole foods. So you have to replace the salt back. Otherwise, you're not getting the salt that we used to get because if you ever look at a, a pack of lions, they're just covered in salty blood, right? Because in order to get to the meat, you got to get through the salt and the fluids. We don't get that anymore. So it's really salt to taste. Um, salt your foods well uh, and 
you know, typically I like to actually have about a thousand milligrams of sodium in the morning. Um, with about 12 to 16 ounces of fluid because you wake up dehydrated because you typically lose about 500 milligrams of sodium at night. Yeah, you've, uh, I, I love the way that I look when I wake up. I, I'm like, everything's like trim and looking good, but, but it's because I'm dehydrated. And now I've started to do what what you recommend doing. I just put a bit of salt in my in my palm, eat it and drink a big glass of water. That's something that you'd recommend for a lot of people to do? Well, that's just what I do. Mm. Um, and the recommendation is just going to be completely dependent on life lifestyle. Cause you and I, we've talked before about coffee intake and I used to consume a ton of coffee and caffeine. The reason why it's a diuretic is because it's a natural erotic, meaning it causes you to lose sodium and, and chloride. So it, it's a salt waster. So four cups of coffee will cause you to lose a half a teaspoon of salt. So if you're a big coffee drinker, you're automatically going to need more salt. Yeah, that's good to know because a lot of people do drink. I mean, I drink one cup of coffee in the morning, kind of one and a half, two if I'm uh, if I just want to. Uh, so you know, considering that when you well, or you'd have to consider when how much salt you need based on how much you exercise and how much caffeine you take. Would that be correct? Exactly, and really your carb carbohydrate intake as well, especially you know when you initially go on what's called a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet, insulin levels go down. And insulin helps the kidneys retain salt. So when you drop your insulin, you you become flushed of salt and fluids. And so the first week of a low carb going from a moderate carb intake to a low carb intake will will cause you to lose about two grams of sodium per day um, for the, for about seven days. And then it goes down to only about 500 milligrams. But at the same time, when you are eating less glucose, you don't absorb salt as well as so there's a decrease in absorption on a low carb diet and you get flushed out more of salt. So if you're on a low carb intake, you definitely need a little bit more salt compared to someone who's consuming a moderate intake of carbs. Got it. Just on that, how, how much, how much, you used to drink like four cups of coffee a day or something, don't you? What are you drinking now? I'm only, I'm down to just one cup of coffee um, in the morning and that's it. And I, I feel like when you have that second cup, like at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. to get through the day, you, the crash is worse than just not having it at all and just pushing through. It's like it's almost like then you need the third cup and then the fourth, and it just becomes it just spirals out of control. Agreed. I mean, I'm certainly like more anxious whenever I have a second cup, and and I always feel I always regret it, but I always want it, but I always regret it. <laughs> like there's nothing to do about that. Um, I, right. and I mean, yeah, please. No, go ahead. Well, I mean, so co I mean, coffee's a double edged sword, just like alcohol, right? It's like a slippery slope. And what's really interesting, I've been um, doing some research on this, is that, I mean, coffee doesn't just inhibit iron absorption. It actually breaks down something called vitamin B1 or thiamine, which is a water-soluble vitamin 2. And um, tea is actually one of the, the worst compounds and beverages at doing this as well. Tea will actually break and split the thiamine molecule or vitamin B1 molecule in half. Um, and so a lot of people are B1 deficient, not necessarily because of low intake, but because they're consuming coffee and tea, which basically splits the B1 molecule in half. And is there so anything we can do about uh, undoing that damage? Uh, apparently, uh, there, there might be. So consuming vitamin C can decrease um, that inhibition, um, although it may actually inhibit some of the transporters that absorb thiamine as well. So the, be the best thing is to space coffee and tea about two hours from your food intake. So you're not really inhibiting the absorption of nutrients unless you have something called hemochromatosis where you overabsorb iron. Then it actually might be beneficial to consume coffee with like red meat. Wow. Okay. That's super interesting. So we, it, we should be keeping coffee and tea uh, if you don't have hemochromatosis to outside of a window <laughs> of two hours uh, so that you can absorb the iron, especially in, I mean, I imagine red meat would like is so high in iron and a lot of women I know premenopausal need a lot of iron. So yeah. we should be careful of consuming tea and coffee around that time. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. Good to know. What, what is the ideal pea color? Do you think? It's not, it's not perfectly clear. I'll tell you that. That's not the idea. It's, it's sort of like a light beer is, is how I kind of think of it or, or like lemonade. Um, because if it's clear, that means you're too diluted. It's too much fluid. You're over consuming water. And most people's urine is either super dark because they're like too dehydrated or they're overhydrated and clear. And you really want it to be 
the ideal is like a light beer color. Got it. And that would mean that your intake, your intake of fluid and salt is good. Exactly. It basically suggests that you're not just consuming plain water. You're consuming so, like a good amount of salt with that water. Got it. So, you know, magnesium, calcium, sodium, um, they're all, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I guess, are they all minerals? Yep. They're all minerals. They're all electrolytes meaning that once you consume them, they dissolve in the fluid and they're electrically charged. And sodium is unique in the, in the aspect that it's, it has an osmotic gradient. Um, only a few molecules have that where they can, it actually moves water depending on if it's high or low. Mm. Um, but glucose does this too. And that, this is actually a problem. So when you have chronically elevated glucose, that will pull fluid into the blood vessels and chronically expand blood volume and chronically lead to high blood pressure. Whereas you don't see that with salt intake. When you consume a normal amount of salt, you don't like have a chronically elevated level of sodium pulling in fluid and leading to high blood pressure chronically. That's what happens with glucose or if you overconsume dietary sugar. Wow. So this is, this is what you mean when you say don't blame salt for what the sugar did. Exactly. 100%. And not only that, a lot of people think salt is addictive, but in fact, if you don't get enough salt, that overactivates the dopamine reward centers in the brain because it's, it's a safety mechanism to try to get you to seek out salt and consume it more and get, you get a greater high when you find it in the diet. But the problem is, is sugar hijacks that reward system. So when you're not getting enough salt, you actually are much more likely to have sugar cravings. You get a high, greater dopamine release with sugar. And animal studies show um, things like Adderall and other like substances of abuse actually become more addictive simply by depleting the animal of salt. Huh. Wow, that's amazing. So essentially, you could if, if uptaking your salt would mean that you could possibly decrease the need to eat more sugar, um, even like you know drink or do you know addictive substances. Right? Is that correct? It's basically like what I tell people is if they're having a sugar craving, first try some pickle juice or try some salt and fluids and see if that, you know, decreases that sugar craving because a lot of times the signals get crossed because you have taste receptors for both salt and sugar and they both activate the reward center, except that when, when you're on the low side of salt and you're not getting enough salt, that activation gets hijacked by sugar and now you're getting a greater reward from it. Wow. Okay. So we've, we've heard about how important all these minerals are, particularly sodium. Um, is it possible to get enough from our, our food or do we need to be supplementing accordingly? I mean, if you're the liver king and you're drinking blood, right? Like and getting salt from blood, <laughs> then maybe you could get enough from food. But um, your, your typical average diet that pulls all the blood and pulls all the interstitial fluids off of it is maybe, you'll, you'll be lucky to get one gram of sodium. So that's why when a lot of people start a low carb ketogenic diet, they're so dizzy because they're just, they're just not consuming enough salt. And really most studies show that between three and five grams, which is about one and a half to two teaspoons is about you know the optimal range for most people. Yeah, amazing. Have we seen a drop in, I'd love to talk about our food today, especially whole foods. Have we seen a drop in the nutrients within those foods in the last yeah. 50, 100 years? Yeah, we've had, we've actually seen the drop in sodium in, in actually about, by about 20%. So what ends up happening, yes, there are less minerals in the soil, but that's not really the biggest problem. Um, the a lot of the big problems are number one, um, acid rain and the acidity decreases the uptake of minerals into the plants and hence uptake into the animals that are eating them. So that's one, the acidity of the soil is, is now increased. So there's a decrease in mineral uptake. The second is we grow food rapidly now. So there's less time for the actual plants to take up the nutrients because we grow for yield essentially versus like just letting the plant grow for a long time. Um, and so on average, we've lost 35% of the magnesium in uh, fruits and vegetables and about 20% in animal foods. And 
it goes across the board, copper, calcium, iron, they're all down between 20 and 80% compared to just 50 years ago. So that would mean, would that be your evidence for why we should be supplementing? Well, just to put a caveat, that's with conventionally grown foods. If you're consuming actual, let's say regenerative, like from a regenerative farm, the uh, fruits, vegetables, animals from a regenerative farm, then you're probably not gonna see those type of losses. So I would say yes and no, but also just the health of the soil itself is clearly different than um, the ancient Egyptians or the Hunza that actually just had this beautiful silt and grew, used to grow all their uh, food on a very fertile soil, much different than what we grow our food in the Midwest, just dry, you know, you know, soil that's just dead essentially. So yeah, I mean, most likely you have 90% of the population is deficient in at least one vitamin and mineral. And when you start looking at about one in three people are deficient in about 10 vitamins and minerals. So yeah, the average person probably does need to supplement because that's just what the data shows. Well, I'd love to talk about that. So what percentage of the American population like is to like, you know, vitamin D deficient, magnesium deficient, sodium deficient? What do we know the answers to those questions? We know the intake is, is deficient compared to the recommended dietary allowances. So for vitamin D and magnesium, half the population is not consuming what's quote unquote an adequate intake to just prevent frank deficiency um, because the RDAs are not optimal intakes. The RDAs are simply to prevent 99% of the population to not have a frank deficiency. Um, and so, yeah, we have good data that, you know, basically half the population is not consuming the adequate intake for vitamin D, magnesium, um, calcium is about, is about the same as well, potassium similarly. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, if we look at the other minerals as well, manganese, copper, most people aren't consuming even an adequate intake. Got it. Um, before we move on from salt, I want to ask one question. What what is what is an ideal? What is a what is a good salt? What do you recommend uh, types of salt to eat, um, and then not recommend eating? Well, I'll preface it and say, I would rather someone consume, let's say, Morton table salt than not get enough salt because it is an essential mineral. Mm -hmm. Now, I I personally consume Redmond real salt because it can, naturally contains iodine and other trace minerals, and plus it's from it's from an ancient dried up ocean, so. I try to avoid salts from modern day oceans because you have modern day microplastics in the salt. And that's, there's been a few studies coming out that have shown that yes, microplastics do get in the salt if it's pulled from a quote unquote modern day ocean. Yeah, got it. I love Redmond and I've just started using their electrolytes too, uh, previous to exercise. I think they're, an, um, they're awesome. Um, they're not sponsoring this yeah. or anything. Well, unless something changes, but I think they're sensational. Uh, what do you think of, uh, what, well, a lot of people use pink, uh, uh, Himalayan pink salt now. What do you think of Himalayan pink salt? Yeah, I mean, Himalayan pink salt is pretty similar. It's a, it's a rock salt, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's an, unre it's an unrefined salt. So that's the advantage compared to your typical Morton salt is going to be, be refined. They typically use explosives to get the salt out. Um, and they, they do bleach it and they do use dextrose in, in your regular salt. Got it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about, my wife was wondering about iodine. Um, I know that in Morton sea salt, they, they, oh, sorry, in Morton salt, they, they put iodine in, in, which is an essential mineral. Um, and you, you mentioned yeah. that you like Redmond because it naturally has iodine in it. Could you say that like this, this use of sea salts and, 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 and whatnot with no iodine in it contributing to the deficiency in iodine that we see in Americans today? Yeah. So it's a common misconception that a lot of people think if you're getting sea salt, it's going to be high in iodine, but it's actually this typically the sea salts that are actually depleted in iodine. Now, iodine is a very slippery slope as well because it has a low therapeutic index, which means you, if you really get up, start getting above 300 micrograms, you might increase the risk of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, but the Japanese, they typically consume about 1,000 micrograms. So they're, they consume a fairly high amount. They seem to be fairly protected from Hashimoto's. So if you got to be careful with your intake of iodine. 
that the RDA is 150 micrograms. Mm -hmm. um, you get it from things like yogurt, cranberries, um, a few other sources, and then salts, either natural salts that contain it or not. Um, I would say most people are probably getting enough to be fair, but. Okay, got it. Um, I want to talk about meat because I know you love to eat meat. I love to eat meat. Is, uh, can meat be bad for you? It, it can, if you overcook it and char it, if you're consuming a lot of processed meats, then yes. Um, if you are consuming, you know, 100% grass fed, grass finished meat, you're cutting off the char, then that's probably one of the most nutritious foods you can consume. Yeah, uh, I, I, I certainly like to eat um, high nutritious foods and I really love to eat a lot of meat, but what about eating a lot of muscle meat? Can that be a problem? Because eating steaks, uh, eating ground meat, mm -hmm. it's not, it's, it's a lot of muscle meat. Is, 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 can that be a problem as well? If you don't balance, so muscle meat is high in iron, but low in copper. So if you're just consuming muscle meat, then that can lead to quote unquote iron deficiency anemia because copper is needed for iron to move around the body. So you really do want to always make sure you're consuming some source of copper if your diet is high in muscle meat. So that would be liver, oysters, if you tolerate those. I don't, I've had some sketchy oysters in the past and I've had some, <laughs> some days on the toilet, you know, <laughs> that I don't want to. <laughs> Don't really want to like go through again. So I, I stick to my organ blends like liver and heart um, to get my nutrients. Yeah. Excellent. I hate that canned oysters. I just can't do them. <laughs> the last time I had canned oysters, I was throwing up through my nose. See, so. Oh, okay. see, I, yeah, I just, I, I, I can't possibly. So how do we, so how, yeah. So how do we undo the effects of, like you mentioned, copper is a good thing to undo the effects of too much muscle meat. Um, other bad effects that meat can have, like you mentioned, uh, charring is just to cook it just to cook meat lightly without there being a char. So like maybe in an, in an oven tends not to char too much or just in a bit of water or, or a lot of oil or how do we avoid the char? Right. Yeah. Lower, lower temperature cooking, but I like to grill. So I just cut off the char, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and that's sort of how I get around it. You can, olive oil coating does reduce the, some of the advanced calculation on products, um, marinating in red wine and uh, some herbs and things like that can help too. Um, the other potential problem with just consuming muscle meat is the, it's not high in glycine. So you wanna eat collagenous meats like drumsticks, uh, turkey necks, things like that, or, or literally collagen peptides to offset the high methionine. Um, and then the other thing too is uh, eating a lot of animal foods does contribute to the acid load. So you want to either consume some type of, you know, greenish bananas or organic potatoes to offset some of the acid or sodium citrate or sodium bicarbonate supplements or mineral waters to offset some of the acid of, of the animal food. Got it. So eating, eating a lot of meat can, can make you high acid. And essentially you want to be eating like, um, like you mentioned, green bananas, even, even vegetables, like just in general are probably good to make sure that you get enough of too. Yeah. And I mean, I have to, I have to preface it with some of the science because, you know, when people start saying that, that your diet contributes to the acidity of your body, a lot of people will instantly think, um, you're like a quack. Um, just to preface it, I've published several review papers on this topic. Um, and there's a limited capacity that the kidneys can actually excrete acid before some is retained. Okay. And that's about 40 to 70, what's called milliequivalents of acid. Just basically, if you consume like a pound of meat or more, you're probably retaining some acid and that will deplete your bicarbonate levels. So yes, your, your dietary acid load does contribute to the acidity of the body. It typically doesn't show up in the blood until very late on because we have a lot of buffering systems in the blood like albumin and hemoglobin to offset the acid. But the interstitial fluid and within the cell will actually be acidic even if the blood looks pretty good. And that can lead to things like insulin resistance, blah, blah, blah. But basically, I hate just saying acid load without giving a little bit of science to let people know this isn't just like hocus pocus. Yeah, to make sure that you're not telling them to drink alkaline water. Correct. Yeah, that actually doesn't really work unless it contains 
sodium bicarbonate um, because the pH, even if, even if you're consuming a water that's a pH of nine, that doesn't offset the acid load at all. It has to con contain something like bicarbonate to actually alkalinize the body. Wow. Okay. Super interesting. I wanted to ask you, why do you eat green bananas? Uh, it, they're not 100% green. They're green-ish. Right. Um, and that's sort of to increase the resistant starch. And so that basically reduces the actual glucose spikes. It gives you more of a feeling of fullness. And it contributes to the basically the, star, the fiber that the microbiota consume to give you short-chain fatty acids that are you know, they do have some benefits. Fascinating. Yeah, I really did want to ask you about that. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, grass-fed meat, what is the, what is uh, grass-fed and grass-finished pastured meat? What are the advantages that that, 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 that a meat like that has? Why is it more nutritious than grain-fed? Well, most of the nutrition, nutritional difference is actually in the vitamin E uh, content and the beta carotene, which actually will get into your own LDL particles and reduce the oxidation of your own LDL. So a lot of people typically think of um, grass-fed meat and grain-fed meat as not being that much nutritionally different. Somewhat true of a statement. The omega-3s are higher, particularly in the fat of the meat will be much higher, but most people aren't consuming straight fat. They're just, they're consuming the meat. So the omega-3 difference is there is more, but it's not a huge difference, but it really comes down to the antioxidants. Um, the vitamin E is about 10 times higher. It's called alpha tocopherol and the beta carotene content is about seven times higher. Um, and so when we think of meat in the context of heme iron and oxidation, we want to be consuming it with things like antioxidants. So the grass fed meat, because it has more vitamin E and beta carotene is not only going to protect the food from oxidizing in your stomach, but also it may help your own LDL or bad cholesterol from oxidizing. So would you say for people who can't really, who don't have a lot of money, who can't afford grass fed meat, if they're going to eat meat to eat lean cuts of grain fed meat rather than fatty yeah. cuts, is that, does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I mean, you're, you're right. Not everyone can afford grass fed, grass finished meat. But when you really think about it, you should all be trying to consume it, not just from a nutritional perspective, but because if you're consuming grain fed meat, then you are supporting companies like Monsanto in monocropping and pesticides and herbicides, which grain fed meat will be higher in glyphosate and all of those pesticides and herbicides that are being sprayed on the crops that they're consuming. Or if you consume, you know, regenerative meat, then you're supporting not only you know, less chemicals for yourself. But if you actually, studies show that if you consume regenerative meat, it's actually carbon negative. So for every pound of flesh on a regenerative farm, you can actually have negative six pounds of carbon. Um, whereas conventional meat is the exact opposite. It's six um, for every pound of flesh on a conventional farm contributes six pounds of carbon to the system, which is not good. Yeah. I mean, I've always recommended to people who can't, you know, who can't afford like a, a grass fed, grass finished ribeye, just ground beef grass is a grass fed yeah. ground beef is very affordable. And it's, I love, I think it's absolutely delicious. No, that's a great point. I mean, ground, the grass fed ground meat is like nine ninety nine a pound. Um, if you go to your local store and you just buy your typical processed ham, it's nine ninety nine a pound. Yeah. So like, you're really not saving any money. It's like the same cost. How do you get your meat? Do you, do you order it from a, an online uh, a, a butcher and you have it delivered to you or you got a butcher, a local butcher that you like to use? Two places. One, my local grocery store, Wegmans, or two, um, North Star Bison. That's where I get my organ blend. Oh, nice. And North Star, is that just bison? No, they have elk. They have... Um, Beef, chicken, pork. Wow, amazing! That sounds that sounds sensational. I've been using Butcher Box, and I think they're fantastic too. But there's not a lot of organs that seem to come with them. Let's talk about that for a bit, because I mean, organs of they can be hard to stomach on their own, obviously. And I know a lot of people are taking, you know, ancestral supplements now, thanks to the Liver King uh, tablets, all this mm -hmm. stuff, trying to get organ meats into their diet. Is there a way that you recommend doing it? I've tried the capsules. I question how much, like, 
if I told you take this steak capsule, would you would you think it's the same as eating a whole steak? I, I wouldn't. So I mean, there might be some nutrients in um, in the organ capsules, so they may have some benefits. But I would I always prefer to get it from food first. I tried some of the capsules. I personally I got some migraines on them, so I, I just don't really take them. Um, but I, I like the blends. If you can find a butcher who will blend the liver, the heart, whatever organ you're trying to get in like a ratio of 75% muscle meat and 25% uh, organs, then you barely taste it, especially if you make it into a burger. So you do a cheeseburger or you do, um, you can, there's two other things you can do really that work well. Chili will work good with organ blends. Um, I think I'm drawing a blank on the third one here. Turmeric? Well, regardless, you know, you make taco meat, Gary, that's it. That's the third one. Love it. I, I want to talk... <laughs> I want to talk a bit about immunity um, because you've written this book, The Immunity Fix, and around the same time every year, I get the flu or I get the cold. Um, I want to know what the, and it's usually obviously coming into winter, which I think would be the seasonal time. What is the best way to avoid getting sick year after year? Because I think a lot of people are the same. They get sick once a year and that's the time that they get sick. Okay, so you can't like technically avoid it unless you live in a bubble. So you're gonna get you're gonna get inoculated with the virus or with whatever. Mm -hmm. It's how you respond to it that matters, and that is determined by your nutritional status. And then, of course, certain supplements have been shown in clinical studies to have benefit. So N-acetylcysteine has been shown to reduce influenza-like illness by about thirty to fifty percent. Um, medicinal mushrooms like reishi. Um, uh, maitake, those things also have similar evidence as well. Things like glycine and glutathione, uh, which glycine is an amino acid required for glutathione synthesis, which is an antioxidant, has been shown to have benefits. And even um, bovine colostrum, the mother's first milk, which contains lactoferrin, has been as evidence too for helping with you know colds and things like that. Amazing. So those 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 things there, you know, uh, that you all mentioned, they're things to take when you get sick. Correct. They're essentially. I mean, you. I mean, there's there doesn't seem to be any harm for at least you know well quality medicinal mushrooms. Um, some of the studies have lasted six months to twelve months, um, and actually, and N acetylcysteine in the clinical study was started just prior to the cold and flu season and they continued it for six months so it wasn't like okay i got sick and this is an acute this was actually started just before the cold and flu symptom uh season um but elderberry is sort of something that's like a short term if you get sick it does have four clinical studies showing that it you know reduces the uh, duration and the uh basically the severity of both the, the influenza and the common cold. Got it. So those are things to take once you do get sick. And then what are you, you know, and you said like, you kind of mentioned like where you're at when you do get sick nutritionally uh, and metabolically, yes. uh, what, what can you do to be most ready? Like, you know, you're going to go out into the world. You're not going to live in a bubble. You're going to see people. Someone's going to have something. You're probably going to get it. Uh, how to best be best prepared for that moment. I mean, if I had to like pick certain nutrients from top to bottom, vitamin D is up there, magnesium, zinc, selenium, vitamin C. Those those are like your top dogs. Right. Copper is important too, but really every nutrient. I mean, B1, all the B vitamins, they do contribute to your nutritional status and your immune status as well. Um, vitamin A, vitamin D, which is in cod liver oil. Uh, so I do take cod liver oil to try and boost my vitamin A and, and vitamin Me D too. Uh, intake. Nice. I mean, I've done this where I got like a ton of sun for probably two months. I checked my vitamin D levels. They were deficient. So like you can't just rely on sunlight. I mean, I do love sun and I love getting morning sunlight to set my circadian rhythms and this and that, but you can't always rely on it for a nutrient status to be optimized. Yeah. So that's what you're mentioning. The cod liver oil essentially will help your body get more vitamin D, whether you're getting a lot of sun or not, or it'll help that vitamin D from the sun to actually get into your system. It, so if it's, you got to check the bottle because not all cod livers will have a decent amount of vitamin D, right. but um, 
I know for a fact Rosita cod liver oil does have a good amount of vitamin D in it. Got it. Okay. Well, yeah, cod liver oil seems like a, a my mom was a my mom was a nurse in the seventies, and so when we were kids, whenever you were sick, it was vitamin C and cod liver oil, and it was it was yeah. that even when you weren't sick, like it was just every every day vitamin vitamin C and cod liver oil. So like some of these old things, they make sense and they're tried and they're tried and tested by the science, which is good. Hundred percent. Um. Uh. Yeah. So let's talk about what not to eat, especially for the immune of the immune system. I mean, I think that part of perhaps the seasonal cold and flu would be the fact that we're all getting together, we're partying, we're drinking, we're eating sugar, we're eating fried foods. Would you say that that's correct? Well, yeah, that in regards to that's correct, that those type of foods are hurting your immune system 100%. Alcohol damages the intestine, reduces your ability to absorb nutrients, actually reduces your ability to activate nutrients as well and flushes nutrients out of your system. Um, which is why this is interesting. Just a just a one day binge on alcohol has been shown to actually cause Wernicke's encephalopathy if you overdo it, which is a severe vitamin B1 deficiency and can kill you. So you gotta be really careful with alcohol. It's, it's probably the biggest nutrient depleter you can do if you overdo it. Omega-6 seed oils, which damage the intestine and, and increase inflammation. And we gotta look at nutrient status, not just from like an intake perspective. Like if a substance is causing your body to be inflamed, then the burn rate for those nutrients dramatically goes up. Um, if you eat a lot of refined carbs, your need for certain nutrients like magnesium, like thiamine, which is B1, all go up. So it's really just avoiding the processed junk and just eating the whole foods that you we used to consume over the last 2.4 million years. Yeah, the omega-6, oils that you mentioned, which, which are they is, could you go through a list of them? Cause I get people all the time when I say vegetable oil going, wait, coconut oil, wait, all olive oil. Could you just specify which right. of those are? Yeah. So the, the, the oils that you typically want to avoid, especially for cooking is corn oil, safflower, sunflower, sesame, peanut oil, uh, rice bran, grape seed. Those are the omega-6 seed oils. The oils that are okay to cook with are extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, butter, um, ghee, things like that. And those bad oils that you mentioned, what what is the problem with cooking with them? Is it does it make it carcinogenic? Heating it up? Yeah, heating up those they have a lot of double bonds, which are very susceptible to oxidation when you cook them, and so you form what's called lipid hydroperoxides and aldehydes, which are carcinogenic even breathing them in is carcinogenic. I mean, I don't know if you have ever gone through like fast food and just smelling it, you can like, you can like smell the carcinogens coming off of that deep fried food. <laughs> well, I never knew that that, that was carcinogens. That's carcinogens. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It is. That's amazing. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, I got a bunch of questions from my followers on Instagram. Um, and a lot of questions about supplements and especially inositol. What are supplements that you take day to day? And then I'd love to talk about inositol. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess starting with my coffee, I always put in about two grams of inositol in the coffee. And then I try, I usually take two grams in the evening. Now we, our bodies make it, make inositol from glucose, but a lot of things inhibit that from happening, such as magnesium deficiency. If you don't have enough magnesium, you can't actually convert glucose and make inositol. Um, high sugar levels will increase your inositol need because it decreases its absorption, increases its kick out. It's, so how insulin works is through inositol. So when insulin hits its receptor, it doesn't do anything like directly. It's not insulin that's doing it. It's, it releases all these little inositol compounds. And that's what's actually causing the GLUT4 receptor to come to the cell membrane and bring in glucose. So it's those inositol compounds. So inositol has been studied in PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome. It's been studied in women that are at risk of diabetes and pregnancy and dramatically reduces um, gestational diabetes by like 90%. Wow. If you consume inositol when you're pregnant, at least that's what the clinical studies show. Um, and it helps us to synthesize glycogen, burn through glucose, burn through fat, because again, it allows insulin to work and it allows us to 
you know, basically athletically perform well, it drives creatine into the cell. So it's just an overall very important compound. It even helps our thyroid hormones from working. There was one study in people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis who took inositol plus selenium and dramatically improved their, like their high TSH and things like that and in their thyroid hormone function. Amazing. I, I heard you mentioned selenium. How do you get enough selenium? Are you just taking a pill or eating Brazil nuts? I'm taking um, what's called Seleno Excel. It's just selenium from yeast. Got it. Got it. And what do you take day to day as far as supplements are concerned? I take black seed oil um, for allergies and as an antioxidant. Is that? Did you say um, black the, black seed? Black seed oil. Got it. It's the exception to the harmful omega six seed oils um, because you don't cook with it, and it has all these um, beneficial compounds. So I take that for allergies. I take that for ox antioxidant. Um, um, you you know, it's all. I then take uh, I do take reishi mushroom for immunity, um, and it, it does have. I'm not saying this prevents or treats cancer, but it does have numerous anti-cancer effects. And we're exposed to all these environmental toxins, so I do take reishi, which is also good for allergies as well. I do take a B complex from quinoa sprouts. Hmm. Um, and I do take uh, a, a certain B1, benfotiamin, which is a lipid-soluble B1. And I also take a, another type of thiamine called, um, it's called TTFD, which is a really good bioavailable thiamine. Um, I, do take, um, I do take some fish oil because I, I really don't like the taste of uh, salmon that much. I do try to consume wild salmon, but like there's definitely periods where I'll go like three months without eating fish. So I'm like, I got to consume some fish oil, some cod liver oil. Um, I do, I used to supplement with like, uh, like acerola and camu camu for like vitamin C, but now I just like consume clementines for that. And then I'm trying to think what else, I mean, I do supplement with relight, uh, Redmond relight for my performance. Yep. I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the omega threes. Um, I heard in a different podcast, you mentioned omega threes in order to kind of, um, go against the ill effects of eating too much meat. Is that correct? Well, so omega-3s, most people are deficient in them. Even though they're cons not considered non-essential, they're conditionally essential. Meaning, like, your need for them increases when you work out. Or you, you need them to basically reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. I mean, if you have an omega-3 index of less than 4%, which is the omega-3 saturating your red blood cells versus 8%, you're at like a tenfold higher risk of dropping dead, which is called sudden cardiac death. So omega-3s are really important to have anti-arrhythmic effects. Um, they seem to reduce the risk of dying if you have a heart attack. Um, so it's really, and, and most people don't get it unless they're consuming wild seafood. Like even if you consume salmon, 90% of the salmon is farm raped mm -hmm. and it's just full of omega-6 and doesn't have a lot of omega threes. Um, and so, yeah, meat doesn't really have that much omega three. So if you're gonna take omega threes, then yes, that does have a benefit in addition to just consuming muscle meat. And is this because of the omega three, omega six ratio being a very, like a, a great marker for good health? Is that why omega threes are so important? I mean, cause uh, uh, you know, red meat isn't particularly high in omega six, uh, in, in omega three, but salmon and wild caught seafood is so is that what's going on here yeah like so omega-3 is important for brain health important for eye health we used to get a bunch of them through eating brains you know like basically if you look at a lot of the um the data on like um, the amount of skulls around like just geographical, ecological, all these like um, sites, ancient human sites, they used to have like a lot of the skulls were cracked open because when we were scavengers, really the only other animal that could actually crack open a skull and get the omega-3s in the brain is a hyena. So really they were, they were left to, you know, us humans to basically get the bone marrow and get the omega-3s from the brains. We don't do that anymore. So yes, we sort of offset the muscle meat by now getting our omega threes through fish or supplementation. Got it. Amazing. So you know, um, crack a head open and eat some brain sometime, eh? 
<laughs> um, I, I, a couple more questions from my I, I, Instagram followers. Um, best way for a premenopausal woman to get enough iron? Oh, to get it. So iron all comes down to a bioavailability. So a lot of people are tricked into thinking, okay, spinach is a good source of iron because it's high in iron. And that's true. It is high in iron, but the bioavailability is only 2%. Red meat's bioavailability for iron is 20%. So it's 10 times more bioavailable. So even though spinach might have three times more um, iron per gram, it's, you know, one tenth absorbed. So, and there's also all these inhibitors typically in plant foods that uh, inhibit other nutrients from being absorbed. So you got to be careful. I think most women, since their RDA for iron is more than twice that of an adult man, it's 18 milligrams of iron most uh, premenopausal women need versus a man is only eight milligrams. So that's going to be really hard to hit if you're not consuming red meat. Got it. And just to be clear, RDA means recommended daily intake? Allowance. 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 Yeah, I don't know why it's called allowance. Got it. But... Got it. So, but, but, but what you're saying is a lot of women need more iron than what the average man does. Yes, they need about twice the iron. Got it. Yeah. Uh, t- diet tips for men over 55. So as you age, your carb tolerance goes down. It just, that's just what happens. So most people find that, you know, if you're above 55, you do need to notch down the carb intake a bit and start increasing the intake of protein. That isn't to say you can't consume carbs. You just got to probably work out, build more muscle, become more carb tolerant if you're going to do this. Got it. So eating more protein for for men over 55 is, uh, for, uh, for for anyone, like, you know, any men or women should be eating more protein as they age. Is that correct? Yeah, because if you're under eating protein, then you're, it's very likely you're over consuming carb. So as soon as you basically ramp up the protein, then your carb intake will go down. And really for long-term satiety, protein is king. If you want satiety and not feeling hungry four hours after a meal, or, or three hours, you need a good amount of protein. Fiber does hit the stretch receptors and gives you quick satiety, but then you're going to be hungry fairly quick if you don't have protein in that meal. So I like to consume, now I'm obviously I'm a man, I'm muscular, um, and I work out. So I consume at least 50 grams of protein three times a day. I'm trying, because I, I weigh about 160 pounds, I try to do one gram of protein per pound of body weight. And I'm sure you probably hit pretty close. You probably eat even more than that. You're probably what? I mean, I'm 210, 220 pounds. And I don't really measure solid. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I don't really measure. I just, I just, I just eat. Uh, yeah. I mean, I want to talk to you about that. Let's just talk about that right now. So intermittent fasting and building muscle mass. I intermittent fast. I, I skip breakfast every day other than coffee and, you know, some salt and whatnot, and then eat lunch. Is there is intermittent fasting and building muscle mass is possible and how? 100% possible. Most of the data is if you get the total daily protein intake at a certain point, then it doesn't matter if it comes in one meal or four meals. Now it is true that muscle protein synthesis is technically optimized if you consume about 30 grams, 30 to 40 grams of protein every three hours. That is true. But you don't, it's not like it's necessary to do that in order to build muscle. It's not not true. So yes, you can absolutely build muscle consuming just once or twice a day. Yeah, I mean, doing it every three hours is kind of like bodybuilder level, right? Like those those guys, yeah, yeah, my mate's a bodybuilder. He's always carrying around, you know, his rice and his turkey. Like whenever he comes to a party, he brings his rice and his turkey. Cause he just has to go every three hours eating and, and that, and that wouldn't be yeah. good for you, would it? Because I mean, I've read your, the longevity solution and uh, where you talk about, you know, mTOR and, you know, co- where, where you, where you have like, you need to suppress mTOR in order to live for longer, don't you? So you need, it's like, you want to have mTOR activated at the appropriate times and you don't want it chronically activated. So protein, carb, after a workout, that's great. That's when you want to activate mTOR. 
when you're chronically consuming refined carbs and sugars that chronically activates mTOR. Got it. Got it. Got it. So yeah, what I'm trying to do is by intermittent fasting is suppress mTOR. And then in the afternoon when I'm eating, increase mTOR so we can, I can build the muscle mass. And that would be the science behind what I'm doing, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's not just that though, too. Um, getting, giving the, um, the stomach, the digestive system, some rest will allow, you know, basically less bloating, improved nutrient absorption, um, improved insulin sensitivity by consuming less frequently. Um, so it just depends. It's not like you have to consume or intermittent fast, but a lot of people do benefit from it. Yeah. I mean, I want to ask about insulin because it's something that I don't really understand. Uh, insulin, uh, you know, you mentioned insulin sensitivity. Is that kind of the way that your body uses the food, your food for energy? Or what is insulin? Like, how does that affect everything? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So it does, it does a bunch of things, insulin. Um, Essentially, like if you want to drive, let's say, magnesium, potassium, creatine into a cell, insulin helps that actually do that. So you don't want to just take creatine by itself. You want to have some carbohydrate and some protein, which stimulate insulin to actually get those nutrients into the cell. And so this is similarly how it works, how insulin gets glucose into the cell is when it hits its receptor it basically signals the nucleus of the cell to basically bring up these glucose transporters called GLUT4, and then the glucose can come in to the cell. So that's how it works on uh, sort of like a you know microscopic level, let's say. But it also uh, does this with fats. It also, uh, insulin is important for, um, you know, basically bringing fat into the cell. So if you want to, drive nutrients into a cell, insulin is basically important for a lot of that functioning to happen. Got it. So almost like, you know, the, the food that you eat and getting the energy from that food, insulin is one of the most important factors in that. Is that correct? It is. And then in order to do that, in order to create energy from the food you eat, how, how we do this is we, you need at least 22 nutrients to do this. Okay. And you need oxygen typically, um, unless you're anaerobic and, or you're, if you're deficient in a certain nutrient, like vitamin B1, then you will actually, instead of using oxygen in the Krebs cycle to create ATP, you actually start pushing pyruvate to make lactate. So you only, you, you push yourself into what's called pseudo hypoxia. If you're deficient in nutrients, particularly B1. And so it's terrible for athletic performance. Um, and it's basically, I tend to not look at calories. Stop talking to me about calories because you need 22 new micronutrients to actually take the food you eat and to create energy. So are you consuming optimal amounts of those 22 nutrients so you can do that and actually take the food and make energy? So I just focus on food quality typically and the calories will come from the quality of the food that you're eating. If you eat crappy food, then you mess up your satiety signals and then you can't control caloric intake, even if you try to. So if people just focus on eating quality food, it typically works itself out. Got it. I wanna ask you something personal now because I see the way that um, people are very, take diet advice very personally. People get really angry and upset if you put out advice that they don't like. and all you do online is put out uh, is a, well, a lot of what you do online is put out diet advice. And I see these people get angry. I just, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, if, if they're, if they're vegan for a certain, you know, ethical reasons, mm -hmm. um, then that's their prerogative. I try, I try not to, I try to avoid that type of discussion. If it's, a, a, a scientific question like, oh, this is harmful, meat and eggs are harmful. Well, tell me why, where's the evidence? Show me and then I'll show you my evidence and we can just have a scientific discussion. It doesn't have to get, you know, nobody knows it all, right? Yeah. We're, we're all trying to figure this, figure this stuff out, so.
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd say that what you're saying is that you just try and make it not personal. And whenever it does seem personal, you yeah. exit the conversation. Right. And I mean, if people have uh, negative comments, that's okay. I, I, don't, I don't like delete them like from my feed. I'll respond in a polite way on why I think they're they're potentially not wrong, but maybe why I believe my viewpoint. Here's the science why I believe this is this way. I could use a little bit of that, mate, because when people come for me personally, I want to lash back, whereas I should rather just go, well, unless you have something scientific to say, I won't be, you know, confronting you about this. Responding to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mate, how do we, how do we uh, get in, keep in contact with you? How do we follow you and see everything that you're doing? And how do we buy Win? Win is on Amazon with um, my other books. Uh, my website is drjamesdenick.com. And then I'm most active on Instagram, which is at Dr. James Dinek. Uh, and if you're not following him, you should. He gives great advice and very simply put, even I understand it. Um, you have to follow Dr. James Dinek Lantonio. He's absolutely sensational. Doc, thank you so much for talking to me today. It was, uh, it was good chatting with you. Luke. Great chatting. You good? Mm -hmm. Mate, thanks so much.